Good morning. Today, I'm here to take you through a lesson that has been included in the NCRT textbook Hornbill for Plus One English. The name of the lesson is The Ailing Planet. This lesson has been taken as an extract from a writing by Nani Palkiwala. Who is Nani Palkiwala? He was a jurist, a civil rights activist, and a top authority on constitutional law. He began the much revered tradition of publicly expounding on the country's budget every year. He was appointed ambassador to the United States and has written prodigiously. Some of his books are We the Nation, The Lost Decades and We the People. This chapter is about how we have been treating our Mother Earth and how we should be treating Mother Earth if we wish to continue living as her guests. That's right, we're not here as owners, but we are merely guests or tenants on Mother Earth's territory. The start to a shift in thinking as to how we should change the way we have been treating our planet began with the start of the Green Moment in 1972. It began as a national party, the Green Party in New Zealand and later on it spread all across the world and the Green Movement has since then been taking up cudgels on behalf of every issue that affects or are potentially going to affect the Earth's health. Till this happened, till the start of the Green Movement, we have had the impression that Earth is a machine. We have had an, a mechanistic view about our planet. We thought that the Earth, the planet was made up of different parts, each of those parts unlinked to one another and that we could more or less do whatever we liked with the various parts without being affected in the least. But since then we have now come to the understanding that the Earth is not a machine, it is an organic being, it is a a living being and that its several parts are inextricably linked to one another. Therefore, if something goes wrong with one part or if we treat one part badly, then the other parts are going to be affected and indeed it will affect the whole earth as one single entity. So this was a radical shift about the way we perceived the earth, a shift from the mechanistic view to the holistic and ecological view of the world. Now such a shift in our thinking has been compared in the textbook to a shift in astronomy that happened when Copernicus declared that it was the earth that goes around the sun and not the sun going around the earth. That declaration then shook the very pillars of scientific society as well as religious society. But since then we have of course accepted that finding and we take it for granted. In such a way the shift from the mechanistic view to the ecological view is still causing ripples here and there. Not everyone have thought about it or accepted it in good faith. We still continue to abuse the earth and its various components thinking that it will never hit back. But it does hit back. We know that it has hit us back, it continues to hit us back. As a matter of fact, many of the natural disasters that we see happening around us in greater and greater frequencies such as earthquakes, avalanches, mudslides, to a certain extent tsunamis, global warming, climate change, the torn ozone layer, extinction of species, all of this can be traced back to the way in which we continue to treat the earth as if it were a machine which would not react to being abused. We think it's okay to finish off a few animals, but what happens if one animal is uh, hunted or poached to extinction? The food chain collapses. What happens if we keep using aerosol cans and air conditioners? 
we are burning a hole in the ozone layer and it's going to make things really really hot literally for us what happens if we cut down trees and clear forests to make fancy furniture we're going to face a warmer earth we are going to lose millions of uh, species that live in the forest so it is only very gradually that we have come to understand that we need, if we are to survive for the next 200 years, we need to be partners in the system of ecology where every living being is dependent upon one another and also dependent on the non-living aspects of earth also. In other words, both the abiotic and biotic components of earth are very much linked to one another and their destinies are very much intertwined. Our earth is a living organism. You don't mess around with it. You don't abuse it, hoping that it will forgive you. It has its own ways of getting back at you. It might do it very slowly or it might do it suddenly with an explosion or with a tremendous wave but hit back it does as a matter of fact there are there are schools of thought that say that uh, the corona pandemic which continue to affect us may be the result of what we humans have been doing unthinkingly several studies and investigations uh, have been commissioned as to what exactly is wrong with the earth they have been trying to quantify uh, the damage that we have done to the earth and they have been trying to pinpoint the causes and more importantly they've been trying to give us recommendations as to what can be done to stem the rot in 1987 the Brundtland commission came out with a report and it was that report that popularized the term sustainable development. The report was commissioned by the World Commission on Environment and Development or the UNCED. Now this was a report that has now coined the term sustainable development which is almost a byword to ecologists uh, and climate change activists today. The essence of the term sustainable development is that we should not meet our developmental needs of the present to compromise the developmental needs of our future generation. In other words, in the name of development, we should not be stripping our earth of its natural resources like trees, forests, fisheries, croplands, grasslands and animal stock not to speak of its mineral wealth. We need to take care of them, use those resources judiciously so that we leave enough for the coming generations to use. The future doesn't happen tomorrow. The future happens today, even as I'm speaking. We need to remember that the amount of carbon footprints that we leave as we go to work and back as we jet around the world will always have a price to pay. How many of us think twice before using a large petrol guzzling vehicle to come to work? How many of us think before not turning on the washing machine unless it is full loaded? How many of us remember to switch off fans and lights when not in use? And how many of us leave the water faucet dripping or the water running unnecessarily when every drop of water can mean the difference between life and death. So your future doesn't start tomorrow or in the next decade or in the next century, it starts today. There are about 1.4 million living species on this earth and there are another 100 million living species which are still unnamed and uncatalogued or classified. Do we spare a thought for them? Do we ever pause to think how our actions might affect these million living species? No, because all the time we are busy thinking of us, humans. 
Now, the Willy Brandt Commission, which was um, headed by the ex-German Chancellor Willy Brandt, in which, incidentally, there was an Indian member, Mr. Uh, Lakshmi Khan Jha, asked the question, after going about its investigation, asked the question to the world at large, to the conscience of humanity, are we to leave our successors a scorched planet of advancing deserts, impoverished landscapes and an ailing environment? Is this going to be our legacy? All in the name of development, is this what we are going to leave to our future generations? Here is a picture of Lakshmi Kanja. Um, he was a member of the Willy Brandt Commission. Now, we have four principal biological systems. These are mentioned in Lester R. Brown's book, The Global Economic Prospect. Now, these four systems are fisheries, forests, grasslands, and croplands. Fisheries, forests, grasslands, and croplands. Here's a picture. Fisheries, croplands, grasslands, and forests. Now, these four biological systems form the mainstay of our economic development. Okay? Most of our food needs are met from these four systems. Most of the needs, the raw materials that we need for our industries are also provided by these four systems. The, the exceptions may be industries that depend on minerals and uh, petrochemicals or petroleum byproducts. But apart from those two, every single thing that we need for our food, for our sustainment, for our industry comes from these four biological systems. But are we taking care of them? Not at all. Let's first take the case of fisheries. The world, at least the developed world, is very conscious of the need for having a protein-high diet, which means you eat more protein and consume less of carbohydrates. This, in turn, leads to a demand for fish. For example, there has been a great consumption of the bluefin tuna, and it has been fished almost to extinction. But now, laws are in place to control fishing of a bluefin tuna. The more we need fish on our plates, on our dining table at home, the less we are leaving for the other creatures in the waters that depend on the bluefin tuna or other kinds of fish for their needs. We are actually making a, a, a cut in the food chain right there. So the more we fish, the less we are going to leave for other, other creatures in the oceans. And that eventually is going to boomerang on us. Forests, we cut down forests, we cut down forests in the name of uh, making buildings, making railways, hospitals, uh, using them as firewood, using it for furniture. Forests are disappearing at an amazing pace. It is said that forests precede mankind and deserts succeed mankind, which means that before humans step in, there were lush green forests. The more we clear forests to make room for new settlements, the more we are destroying our own future. Once humans have settled down and taken everything they can from the resources, they leave that land behind and they move on to, as it were, greener pastures. What do you have? You have barren deserts when nothing grows. Rivers would have dried up trees are cut down, it affects the entire environment, the, the ecology there, and you get deserts, non-livable, uninhabitable deserts, which is why they say forests precede mankind and deserts succeed us. The third biological system are croplands. We have plenty of fields where we grow different kinds of crops, but these two are cutting into the natural resources of the earth. The fourth biological system are grasslands. They are being um, demolished because we are using them for pasture lands, we are using them for grazing and they are being um, destroyed at a very alarming pace. We also clear these two 
areas in order to make new buildings in the name of development. So does that mean that development is a bad idea after all? Not at all. It just means that we should know where to draw the line. We should know how to have a balance between development and between preserving the natural resources of Earth. What we have been doing is making fisheries collapse, making forests disappear, making grasslands barren wastelands and deteriorate our croplands. These form, as I said, the very foundation of our global economic system. And because of our greed, because of the high pace of human consumption, we are unable to sustain these four biological systems. A picture of uh, the bluefin tuna that's been fished almost to extinction, but as I said, laws are now in place to rein in the amount of fishing that goes on. That is a very telling picture of the species that is being fished almost to extinction. He is caught in the net of human greed. There has been a demand for um, trees for various purposes, maybe for uh, building houses or buildings, uh, for making furniture and also for firewood. It has come to such a pass that firewood has become extremely expensive to the extent that what we cook in a pot that's boiling over a fire costs much less than the firewood that's placed in the fire to make the blaze. That's right. Often what goes under the pot, that is the firewood, is cost more than the food that has been prepared inside the pot, inside the boiling pot. Dr. Norman Myers talks about tropical forests which are the powerhouse of evolution. There are several species of life in the tropical forest, but these are facing destruction. Till now, tropical forests had been more or less an untouched wealth, but that is no longer the case. These are being eroded. Humans have been making inroads into tropical forests and destroying the ecosystem there. Uh, wildfires um, uh, have become very much commonplace. We recently read about um, a wildfire that was raging in the Amazon forest. Now this is what verdant forests look like, complete with waterfall and different species of flora and fauna. And, but we are eroding, our actions are eroding tropical forests at the rate of 50 million acres per year. One of the specific reasons of forests being eroded is that we use dung as firewood. It's a cheap alternative to firewood. But on the other hand, when we use dung as firewood, we are depriving our soil of a natural fertilizer. Also, bear in mind that burning dung actually causes damage to the environment because it releases a lot of uh, toxic gases, so it pollutes the environment. So we need really to find uh, a cleaner, less toxic and cheaper alternative to fuel, as a fuel to dung. Uh, natural gas is one such alternative. We really need to plant five times more the amount of trees that we are cutting down and that is in order to meet the demand for fuel wood this year, 2020. This uh, text was written much earlier, so they uh, fast forward to 2020 and said that in order to meet our fuel wood demand for 2020, we need to increase our um, afforestation fivefold in order to meet our needs. Um, this was said in 2006. Now, the case is much more drastic now because even as I speak, the year is 2020. We need to plant maybe seven or eightfold times more trees in order to keep up to a forest, uh, the lands that we have um, scraped clean, all because our, of our selfish needs. It's a picture of uh, the Amazon forest burning. We're not quite sure what was the reason behind the, the blaze. Um, all we do know is that 
hundreds of spe species of flora and fauna have been affected by uh, uh, forest fires such as the one burning in the Amazon. James Speth, who is the president of the World Resources Institute, he says that we are losing forests at the rate of one and a half acre per second, not per year, per second. What laws are in place uh, to protect our forests? Let us just let us just zero in or zoom in to India. Article 48A of the Indian Constitution says that. The state shall protect the environment, but the fact is we are losing 3.7 million acres of forest per year. The actual loss of Indian forest is actually eight times more than the official data. There's an aerial photo that is coming up next that will show the actual damage uh, that we are doing to forest and the United Nations has warned that the loss of forests is about in, in about 88 countries is critical. We just can't afford to lose this much of forest. Have a look at the picture. This is an aerial photograph of um, the damage that we have done to our forest. It used to be all green as here in the top right corner of the picture, but you can see more brown and yellow than green in this picture. All of these parts. Uh, in the photograph taken um, uh, aerially shows the amount of forests that have been destroyed. So it's more yellow than green in this picture and therefore there's going to be all black in our future life if we're not careful about forests. One of the biggest reasons uh, that forests are being uh, disseminated is that uh, we need a lot of uh, space a lot of resources to meet our growing population um, which brings us to the fact that we don't actually enforce the laws that are meant to protect our forests we have several laws in in india regarding um, untouchability or casteism or child labor but are those laws actually being enforced to an extent yes perhaps but there are always cases where you see that these laws are not being enforced and why is that probably because of the corruption of course it is because of the corruption officials who are meant to uh, enforce the laws don't do that there are lots of vested interests at stake there is a lot of lethargy among us the, uh, the average common citizen about enforcing laws we don't expect laws to be enforced and when we see laws being broken we don't do anything about it Population, as I said, is one of the driving reasons that we've had to um, destroy the resources on planet Earth. In, let's look at a few uh, statistics. In 1800, the world population was 1 billion. In 1900, it doubled to become 2 billion. By the 20th century, uh, the population had become 5.7 billion. The current population of the world is 7.8 billion. Now let's look at the case of India. Population of India is 1.3 billion or 135.26 crore which is more than the entire population of Africa and South America put together. Of course population is one of the biggest if not the biggest problems facing India and what can be done about it can we make laws can we force people not to have more children without an element of force it may be hard to control the population many people do not take any uh, steps to control the growth rate for various reasons. Uh, it may not be fair to introduce an element of force or coercion to control the birth rate. We should try to voluntarily control the birth rate in order to save our country. Many people often think that uh, having an extra pair of hands is alright, it will help 
in, in the family. If you have another child, that child will help you to do household work and work outside and probably act as an extra source of income. Uh, what they don't realize it's also an extra mouth to feed. The best solution is education and there is a striking line in the text that says education is the best contraceptive. It is only education that tells people that having more children is actually detrimental to you, to your family, your immediate neighborhood, your state, your country and the world at large. We need to make a choice between population control and perpetration of poverty. Do you need to have more and more poor people in the world or do you need to have lesser but healthier and more fortunate people in the world who have more access to all the facilities around us? We need to make a choice. Do you want to have more poor people or do you want to have better and better adapted people in the world? As I said, there should be voluntary family planning without adding any element of force or coercion as in the case with compulsory sterilization. A concern is now growing that we need to protect not just the people who live on the planet, but we need to protect the planet as a whole. We should get rid of this idea that has been ensconced in our brains for ever so long that human beings are the most important or the only important species worth protecting in the earth, which is far from the truth. There is a sign um, next to a cage in a zoo in Lusaka in Zambia. That sign says the world's most dangerous animal. If you were expecting to see a, a, a python or an anaconda or, or, or a, a jaguar in the cage, you would be mistaken. There's only a mirror there in that cage and the mirror reflects you back, which says that humans are the most dangerous species, the most dangerous predators on top of the food chain who do the maximum damage to other members of the food chain. This, uh, the chapter uh, reaches uh, its end by going back to the idea that was mentioned at the beginning that we are now having a holistic view of the earth which is quite a shift from the mechanistic view. It now sees the world as an integrated whole uh, rather than a collection of uh, linked parts and this is now ushered in the era of responsibility that is right we need to be responsible about our earth and especially uh, people who are the helm of industry because industry does contribute a lot towards uh, spoiling the earth's resources and we have a, a, a quote from Edgar Bullitt who is the chairman of DuPont he said that he wishes to be the CEO, not chief executive officer, but chief environmental officer. And he said that rather than excelling in industrial production or bringing up our profits every year, we should excel in environmental performance. This is the view that should be taken by every single industrialist out there. Now in India, we have the National Thermal Power Corporation, the NTPC, which has set standards in controlling the, pop, uh, the pollution that is caused to the environment by way of the byproducts of thermal plants, electric and thermal plants. Another quotation from Margaret Thatcher, the late UK PM who said, no generation has a freehold on this earth. We're not here forever. We don't own anything forever. We don't own the very house that we bought with our savings. It doesn't belong to us. We don't belong, the, belong to the earth forever. All we have is a tenancy with a full repairing lease. You're just tenants on this earth. You're only here for a very short time, just a blip on the timeline of earth. You're only here for a limited time. And in that limited time, you have the responsibility for making sure that the corner of the earth that you inhabit is kept fully repaired and maintained. That is your responsibility, not the earth's responsibility. Okay, the earth is the landlord, you're a tenant, 
but you have to keep your apartment, your corner of the world in proper shape. Lester Brown, the author of The Global Economic Prospect, the person who had identified the four biological systems of the world, forests, fisheries, croplands and grasslands, he said that we have not inherited this earth from our forefathers, we have borrowed it from our children. This ties in nicely with what Margaret Thatcher has said. We are not here permanently. We don't own anything permanently. We, we're just keeping it safe as a treasured heirloom. We're keeping it safe so that our coming generation can use it. It's not ours forever. And the sooner we get this idea into our heads and start acting upon it, the better for us. With that, we come to the end of the text as such. We now look at certain questions that have been uh, asked at the end of the lesson. I've picked a few questions and have given the answers for those questions. What is the notice, the world's most dangerous animal at the cage in the Lusaka Zoo signify? Well, our planet faces the worst threat from mankind. Man thinks that earth is his property and that he can dominate it to fulfill his selfish needs. And he is the most dangerous predator and he cares only about his selfish needs and in his race for getting what he needs for his consumption, he is destroying several other species further down the food chain. At least other animals don't kill their own for selfish needs, they only kill uh, to, to satiate their hunger or thirst or to protect their young ones or to protect their limited territory. Us human beings go several steps beyond that. It's not just the basic needs that make us destroy one another. Next question, laws are never respected nor enforced in India. Discuss. We interpret laws according to our convenience as with examples of child labor or dowry or untouchability. We never really expect uh, our law keepers to enforce the laws and we as citizens, we ourselves don't follow the laws ourselves. What are the reasons? Corruption. Another reason justice delayed is justice denied. It's no use having a court case that drags on for years and years and years for it to be of any use to the complainant or the wronged party. More often than not, we see in India, people take law into their own hands. They don't wait for the authorities to step in. Sometimes the authorities don't step in because of Western interests. It might be because they have political pressure on them, they might have bureaucratic uh, red tapism on them. There are many reasons uh, which are peculiar to the Indian situation that stops laws from being enforced. Right from not littering your road, right from uh, not smoking in public, and right from how not to use social media to further your own gains, laws are being broken with impunity. And it takes a lot of time before um, justice can be secured from our courts. This is a sad but true um, nature of uh, the Indian law enforcing system. How can we protect our earth for future generations is question number three. We should not make unreasonable claims on the four biological systems. Don't pine for blue fin tuna all the time. You can try some other fish. Don't cry to have the best furniture made of uh, most precious uh, wood in your, in your drawing room. Don't destroy croplands and grasslands because you want to build an extra uh, a shopping mall or an extra uh, skyscraper. You need to make sure that these things, your needs are not actually in conflict with the balance of nature, the balance of these four biological systems. In a nutshell, what are the do's and don'ts that we must take care of in order to protect the four biological systems? Avoid overfishing, preserve forests, avoid using cow dung for burning so as not to deprive the soil of a natural fertilizer. Try and use a natural 
uh, gas instead control population and how can we control population get an education get an education that'll set your mind straight about should we procreate have so many of us more to populate our earth now that's the question answers taken care of now these are some uh, working with language exercises given uh, towards the end of the lesson uh, Latin phrases have been used uh, in the lesson and we need to find the meanings of those uh, Latin phrases. Here we go. The phrases I have uh, picked out here are prima facie, ad hoc, in camera, ad infinitum, mutatis, mutandis and tabula rasa. Let's see what they mean. Prima facie. This can be literally translated as at first phase, the legal term implies that any matter apparently is self-evident on first examination. Ad hoc. This can be literally translated as for this. Its purpose is to propose a solution for a certain specific issue alone. A temporary solution, a temporary posting, a temporary arrangement for a temporary issue. In camera, this is a term that you come across uh, quite often in newspapers regarding uh, legal proceedings, court cases. In camera is a legal term in Latin. The phrase can be translated as in a chamber or in private. It actually details the restricted courtroom scenes and an outsider is not allowed to view those scenes. Ad infinitum. The Latin phrase means to infinity or what continues forever without any limit, what goes on and on and on ad infinitum, something that is multiplied ad infinitum that goes on without an end. Mutatus mutandis, the Latin phrase means to change things that need to be changed. It's about making necessary changes. You have to change what requires to be changed. Mutatus mutandis. Tabula rasa. An absence of preconceived ideas or predetermined goals. A clean slate. We often say that a young child, when it is born, uh, has a mind that's like a clean slate. It has no uh, uh, prejudices or uh, previous impressions. We start writing on the slate. We fill that slate with new ideas. So. Tabula rasa is an absence of any preconceived notions or uh, prejudices or bias. With that, we come to the end of the language questions in the chapter, The Alien Planet. And with that, we also come to the end of this session based on the chapter Alien Planet, which you will find in the NCRT textbook Hornbill, which has been prescribed for class 11. And that's all from me for today and thank you very much.